This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 644, recorded on July 22nd, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's sunny, 76 Fahrenheit, and the Celsius is taking a long time to come up on my Norwegian weather app. Um, we've had mostly cloudy nights, so I haven't seen the comet yet. And it's supposed to be cloudy again tonight and tomorrow night and the next night, but oh well. It's 27 Celsius. My wife called me last week. She was away somewhere. She said she could see the space station moving across the sky. Yeah. Is that true? Cool. I, Is that true? <laughs> I'm not introduced it's yet. It's all right. <laughs> remember as a kid uh, living in Patterson in the, I guess, late 50s, they said, go outside. We, we, they said, that's Sputnik moving across the sky. I don't know, but there was something moving. It was probably an airplane, but who knows? I was like five years old. Also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brian Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. It is 82 and sunny uh, here, which actually turns out to be 28. I know that one, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, that works. And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there. 82 in Austin also and uh, cloudy. We're headed for 94 today, but we're out of the 100 degree days for a while. That's good. Maybe a little rain in the forecast. Uh, and I do want to uh, just briefly touch on, because I've been keeping people up with the uh, situation in uh, Austin, Texas, relative to the virus. Uh, and very briefly, I think we've actually turned the corner on this sucker. Okay. So relative to the surge we had, we got a lot of work left to do. But the... Um, uh, median statistical uh, seven day running metropolitan statistical average of hospital admissions, which is my key indicator of what's going on, is now trending downward. I think we can say that safely. Uh, it's, it's been flat for a while, and I think it's actually going down. Not only that, but if you look at the seven day moving average of actually how many people are actually in the hospital, uh, I think that. That may be actually leveling off. And the question in my mind is whether if you're admitting 70 people on average a day, whether you're discharging people uh, at a lower or higher rate, because just because that's leveled off doesn't mean you aren't going to fill up the hospitals. But I think, may, I think maybe uh, that's uh, leveling off. And what's remarkable to me is that, you know, this is just behavior. We got masks. 50% occupancy of restaurants, bars are closed, no groups la uh, larger than 10, uh, physical distancing, uh, hygiene, the parks are closed. But, you know, people are, and I don't know what it's like to run a small business. I mean, it must be really tough. But uh, uh, life is going on. People aren't locked down, and the cases seem to be decreasing. Non-pharmaceutical interventions. Yeah, we can do this. <laughs> Nothing we can like do them. this. All right. That's good to hear. Well, on a national level, uh, I will. Uh, I like to look at the um, New York Times coronavirus latest map and case count and you know, other curve. We are still at around six, 50 to 60,000 cases a day. Seven-day average in the U.S. as of yesterday is 66,000 cases. 3.9 million total infections diagnosed, of course. There are probably more. 140,000 deaths. And some states uh, are getting their hotspots, right? mostly in the south. You know, Texas is one of them, but Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, Tennessee, of course, California, Arizona, and others are less so. Numbers are surging, they say, throughout most of the U.S., including in many states that were among the first to reopen. And this is important because the number of people hospitalized and the percentage of people testing positive is also rising in many of these places. The case spike cannot be solely explained by increased testing. However, coronavirus deaths remain well below their peak levels, which is good. So that's our sit rep for today. 
It's a good site. We'll put a link in the show notes. A couple of uh, two ish, two things or three or things before we move on to email. I wanted to have a little discussion about an opinion piece published, uh, I believe, yesterday in the New York Times opinion. How to Identify Fluid Research Before It Becomes Dangerous by Michael Eisen and Robert Tibshirani. And I have, a, I have an opinion about this. Uh, so this is dealing with, as you know, preprints. These are manuscripts of research findings that are put on BioArchive and MedArchive, for example, before they're peer-reviewed. And of course, they're picked up by the press and sometimes they're wrong, um, and this has caused a number of uh, I- examples of press reporting on things uh, that are not quite correct. And so this is an opinion on how to deal with that. And and I must say, they do get one thing which is really interesting and right. I like this. They say, it's always been a challenge for science journalists to balance the results of individual studies against the complex and often contentious process by which science converges on a better understanding of reality. That's just so perfect, right? How do you put the papers in together into the bigger picture? And the preprint complicates that because, uh, you know, they're not yet peer-reviewed. Now, even if it's peer-reviewed, it doesn't mean that it's right or that it's even accurate, but at least it's been through that process, right? So what their solution is, They've put together this group of over 100 scientists uh, to join forces and create a rapid review service for preprints of broad public interest. And there's a link to this. And so their idea is this is a diverse contingent of scientists. doesn't look so diverse to me, frankly. Ready to comment on new preprints and be responsive to reporters on deadline. This would provide journalists reliable access to independent scientists to help deal with today's growing stream of preprints. All right, so... I, I will love to hear you, your opinions here, but I think this is – I'm not a, a fan of this. First of all, this looks like an elitist group of people. How do we? How are these picked? I mean, did they volunteer? You know, what is this? Is this as diverse as it could be? And um, why do we need this? Why – it's? it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what these individuals – the press will always find someone to say something about a preprint, uh, and it's uh, not going to matter. I mean, we, that's what we try and do here on Twiv. We try and talk about papers. We can't do them all, of course. But uh, we're part of this, hey, here's a preprint, and here's what we think is good or bad about it. We do that all the time. So uh, I'm just not enthusiastic about this at all, mainly because it seems like a club. And uh, I'm not sure it's going to work. You think journalists are really going to go to this list and call people? I, I don't think that's how it works. What do you guys think? Uh, do the uh, do the preprint sites like BioArchive and MedArchive? Do they not have space for comments on papers? Yeah, there there's plenty of space. Yeah, there's uh, and they, and they redirect those, all the are, tweets and stuff. They go there and there are comments as well. Yeah, right. Sure. And all uh, and so that's used, right? Yeah. In fact, and they say in this article uh, that that's good that that happens, but they wanted to formalize it, right? They say we can't depend on Twitter. <laughs> I don't know. Twitter does a pretty good job in some cases. It seems to me. Uh, other cases, it falls flat on its face, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just because of what's been done on Twitter, I just cannot endorse it as a, except anything but a casual place for discussion. Right. Okay, and I right. for a journalist to make a decision based on a Twitter discussion, I think is is not a good idea, considering how it's been misused by many people. Well, I don't really know how the comments section of uh, these uh, preprint sites are really used. I personally haven't paid much attention, but it does seem to me that uh, this mechanism is being proposed is potentially redundant of that, okay? Mm. But maybe that mechanism could be mm, monitored or something uh, managed in a fashion to uh, make it uh, uh, more usable if it's not already. Mm. What do you think, Kathy? Any opinion? Well, I hadn't looked at the list till now because I read the hard copy version in the newspaper Mm. Uh, (laughs) and uh, claiming that it's diverse is to me bogus out of the hundred. It looks like 36 of them are associated with Stanford university (laughs) Um, just by doing a little Google search thing on the doc itself. 
Um, well, this says this list says signers, and it's up to 104. Mm. So if that's who they think it is, but it doesn't look to me like it's got enough women. It certainly doesn't have geographic diversity. I don't know that it has scientific diversity. Yeah. Do they have physicists, geologists, oceanographers, you know, climate scientists? It's kind of like who made you king? <laughs> it's the way I think of looking at this list, you know, but um, I, so, yeah, if there's already comment sections and if reporters are doing their jobs, if they ask somebody to comment and that person is busy, then they ask them for, you know, three or four more names. And, you know, we're doing that. They contact ASV, they contact me and the rest of us because of TWIV. Um, I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not happy with the list of a hundred yeah. people. Uh, that I noticed that when you click on that, it comes up as a spreadsheet. Can yeah. you edit it? Can you add it? Your name? Can you add oh. your name? It's no, it's view only. Yeah, read okay. only. What do you think, Brianne? Yeah, I I think that I agree uh, with everyone about the sort of lack of diversity or of this list and the fact that it does seem like you know just uh, their friends club. Um, I I like that they are addressing the fact that reporters often have a pretty tight turnaround, um, and that is sometimes a challenge uh, for them in terms of our schedules. Um, as scientists and our ability to work on that same uh, t- time schedule. Um, but I think that there are other ways to do this, like the comment section that make a lot more sense. And I think that just in general, you know, we need to make sure that both our science journalists and our readers of science journalism um, think about how do you critically analyze data how do you critically think about these problems and so to me it comes back to you know this need for us to think to enforce critical thinking not enforce uh encourage critical thinking um among a lot of people you make a good point brian to some extent the onus really is on the uh, science writers themselves okay if the if the issue here is looking at uh, publication of the material and not just the writers themselves, but the people who write the headlines, oh, because yeah. that's one of the places where it really gets out of control. You ought to, yeah, there ought to be some sort of rule where the science writers are the ones that write the headlines, and the science writers all ought to be uh, taken to task on this. A lot of them are very good. You know, they point out that these are uh, not peer-reviewed publications. They give the original sources. They talk to the uh, appropriate people. I think a lot of them are doing a pretty good job. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I agree. Uh, most many people <clears throat> do not read much past the headline, right? And maybe a few sentences. The headline is really important. And then that goes into an echo chamber. So if somebody yeah. says that uh, such and such a mutation causes increased transmission, all of a sudden, it's, it's over. You know, that's that's it's over. And yeah. and you know, even the first sentence or two, that's a lot of people will just read that, and uh, that's it. So I agree. I think the writers have to deal with this. There are already organizations that bring together scientists and science writers, like Cyline, which is a triple A S uh, service for journalists to hook up scientists with journalists who need comments. So I just don't see that this is is actually needed. I mean, I think it's needed more now than any other time during a pandemic, and I'm not sure that you need it otherwise, right? Because there's less- The best thing we could front. possibly do is teach the public how to exactly. evaluate Exactly, exactly. You know? <laughs> well, uh, certainly. You know, to, to, you know, because certainly. I automatically look for sources, you know, and and all of this stuff. I don't take anything on at face value. No, in particular, definitely not the important stuff. And if we could teach uh, the public to do that routinely, I mean, it's yeah, you know, I guess it's a little bit difficult because you don't necessarily have the time, but or the tools. But we can yeah. at least at least impart some skepticism um, on. The John Oliver show on Sunday night, that was actually one of his segments, ah. um, was trying to tell the public how they needed to do that. And he had celebrities come together to make a video um, because he thought the public would listen to it if it was coming from various celebrities. 
Hmm. So there's a pretty funny video yeah. online. So, so we should find that video and watch it. <laughs> so John, you should find John, the video and watch it. Although I will say, I don't know that I could show it in my classroom. So yes, John Oliver is not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> now John Oliver and his ilk have lots of followers and they need to mention us. Cause I think as you will see from the letters and you have already seen from weeks and weeks of letters, we're doing a service at our small level here. And I think a lot of people to their credit who are listening are learning how to criticize science from our teaching. So I think, I mean, Malcolm Gladwell has publicized us, which is great, and a few others, but we need to have more people listening. And, you know, just from last week's episodes, a lot of people got turned on to TWIV. And they, wow, mm -hmm. this is so cool to hear these people talking. It's really, it's really fun. So that's the one part. And the other is, um, what was the other? <laughs> there was one other thing. So Brienne talked about John Oliver. All right. Well, I've forgotten what it was. But the, but we do this here, and, and we need more people to listen because I do think it's it's a learning experience. Okay. Um, wait, wait, wait. Time out. Okay. Because not every – I get to show my – Oh, yeah. This run video. <laughs> this is my uh, Anthony Fauci bobblehead. Nice. That's very cool. Yes. Uh, and it, his head does bobble. And on yeah. the back, on the base, it says flatten the curve. Great. And cool. I've decided that that's, I think that's what his little hand gesture there is. Yeah. Flatten the curve. Flattening. Mm -hmm. All right. So <laughs> Great. thanks, Tony. Nice. All right. Have to get one. Um, also today in the New York Times, an opinion piece from Gretchen Whitmer course is the uh, governor of Michigan and uh, it is called mask up America <laughs> and she is writing that um, this is important for everyone to do she I want to just quote one part of it um, you know she's Trump has of course said it's patriotic to wear a face mask covering and she says she writes I applaud his statement and urge him to back it up by issuing a nationwide mask mandate like Michigan's requiring masks on public transport indoors or outdoors when a distance of six feet cannot be maintained. It allows exemptions for small children when eating or drinking, communicating with a hearing impaired person, officiating at a religious service, and for those engaged in a public safety role. The president has the chance to save tens of thousands of lives. I'm hopeful that he will seize this opportunity. So obviously the more of this we get, the better. And so this is great. Of course, we've known for some time now that um, many people have called for such a nationwide mandate and it hasn't happened. And I think it will not. <laughs> but, um, you know, here in TWIF, we recognized some time ago also that it's important. Um, so that's really good. Although, you know, not everyone reads the New York Times, unfortunately. Hopefully they can all have more results like Austin's. Yeah, yeah, makes a difference. <clears throat> um, you guys, I, um, I sent to you all on Slack last week this article out of Utah where there was a public hearing and people were all in this room without masks and they were furious that they had to wear masks. And it was scary how adamant they were about not wearing masks. And they would say things like, it's not for me. It doesn't work for me. And it's just, it, I'm incredulous about that kind of behavior, right? Yeah. I'll be interested to see how uh, Georgia plays out, okay, oh. where the governor has uh, actually told the Atlanta mayor mm. that she cannot mandate mask wearing, okay, right. uh, which is uh, which is really aggressive uh, in the in the wrong direction. And uh, in particular, with the president now encouraging people to wear masks, I I, I wonder how, you know, because this is going to, I would predict that over time, this is going to catch on. It's becoming more and more obvious that this makes a difference. Okay? What, what's the outcome of that? Is the, <laughs> did the mayor have to back down or what? Do you know? Uh, um, I think legally. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's actually going uh, into the court system. Yeah. Um, and uh, the judge who was supposed to be making a decision um, recused themselves yesterday. So it's still <laughs> uh, in the midst of court battles. Okay. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. This, Unbelievable. Oh, my gosh. Um, okay, so another story that came out just today. U.S. announces a nearly $2 billion contract for uh, a Pfizer 
SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. 600 million doses by December. It's that first 100 million by December. So I have extremely mixed feelings about that. All right, we've already invested extensively in the mRNA vaccine that we've talked about made by Moderna, which is the mRNA encoding the entire spike protein in a prefusion form. This Pfizer vaccine is also an mRNA vaccine encoding just the part of the spike that binds the cell receptor, the receptor binding domain. How long is that domain? I don't know. I was just listening to Trevo know. and I should remember too, but it's certainly not. The, it's not very long. Not very no, long. No, I think that's actually in the email that we got from John Udell. Yeah. It's, it's much, it's 300 amino acids out of 1200. That but, sounds about right. How long is RBD? Let's see <laughs> if, if Google can handle you're gonna that. You're going to get it. You're going to get, oh, no, that's no. Uh, that's RBG. So you're going to get a, a <laughs> measurement for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. There we go. I, I, if I put how long is the spike RBD, then I get a nature paper right there. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see if we can. I've oh. got the, the Udell email. Yes. Said that the spike is 1273 yeah. and that RBD is sixfold smaller. 200-ish 200, so 200. 200 amino acids. Okay. All right. So why don't I like this? First of all, I, I have issues with just the spike because I think fo focusing on spike, you know what? Most of the HIV vaccines that have been tested are mainly GP120. There are a few other proteins thrown in. They're all failed. And so this, most of them are on spike. And now this is even shorter than spike. All right. The idea here is that the receptor binding domain is all that matters. Blocking attachment is all that matters. And- I just think that's flawed. I teach that to students every year in virology. Neutralizing antibodies don't just block attachment. They work in many other ways. So why are we focusing on just receptor binding domain? I, I, I think we better to diversify our investment, and I think it's fine to spend money ahead of time before you know if something works in this case, but diversify it. Don't do a subset of what <laughs> Moderna but, is doing. Well, especially because at least with Spike being... 1200 and some amino acids that's long enough that there are probably some t-cell epitopes in there yes um and so you're probably going to get um some you know potentially some t-cell responses when you shrink it down to be just the rbd you're really relying just on the antibody response you're much less likely to have a t-cell epitope in there yeah and we were we we're you know i i just stumbled yesterday i should bring it up this paper and we should talk about it it's a paper from years ago from George Gao in China, saying that T cells are important for recovery from SARS-1, not antibodies, SARS-1. So, you know. I'll have to look at that paper. I, I don't know. I was so searching this, for something else and it came up. So that's what happens all the time. Yeah. This uh, $2 billion is uh, part of the Operation Warp Speed. I'm not sure if you said that, but no. it's the largest contract yet. Yeah. In the I, I, don't, I don't get it. Do we have any in-person, in-human trial yet of this? Uh, there is a, I'm just looking at this now from the landscape document. There is a phase one slash two trial uh, on clinicaltrials.gov. I can't tell whether it's uh, actually, whether they've actually injected anybody yet. Um, I'm just looking the at The only the, thing I can think of is maybe they're trying to just get more doses because maybe they get not. What did they, you say last week? 500 million uh, Moderna doses are going to be made, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and maybe they want more, and this is kind of similar, but I just don't get this at all. I'm sorry. Uh, the other thing I don't know about this vaccine is how it's formulated, whether it's uh, – I don't see anything here about a nanoparticle or uh, – actually, I should look at uh, – I've got the Pfizer site up here. Yeah, I, I will uh, cruise this while we're talking. All right. All right, then that – Brings us to a paper that was just released, um, I don't know, yesterday, I guess, in Lancet. It's another preliminary phase one slash two study, safety and immunogenicity of the CHADOX-1, and it's they're still using NCOV-19 in the title. I don't know why. Vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, a preliminary report of phase one, two, single blind, randomized, controlled trial. 
what are there two co-first authors, Kathy? Yes, Pedro Fologati and Katie Ewer. Okay, so this and is, a bunch of other people, and the final thing is the Oxford COVID vaccine yeah. trial group. Right, many many people involved in this, and we've talked about this vector before a lot, right? The chimpanzee mm -hmm. adenovirus Oxford vector. Mm -hmm and how it has been previously tested uh, for other vaccines like MERS candidates. We've also mentioned that this particular vaccine candidate, and by the way, oh, I forgot to say this. I always forget stuff. Gosh, I should write it all down. So, you know, the NIH in, in the um, Pfizer story we just did, they call it a vaccine. We're going to buy this vaccine. It's not a vaccine. It's a vaccine candidate. It's an experimental vaccine. Because if you say vaccine, it sounds like it's ready to go. Please, language is important. Um, anyway, here we talked about some time ago that uh, in rhesus macaques immunized once with this Chadox, which encodes the spike only, you get uh, antibody and cellular responses and the, the uh, non-human primates are protected against lower tract infection. Uh, with challenge with SARS-CoV-2. So, so on the basis of all of that, this particular candidate went into a combined phase one, two, which is what this is. This is a preliminary report of that. It's not done yet, just like the Moderna. <laughs> wasn't and, and also the Chadox underwent a name change. Yeah, it did. It, 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 I it did. If which, Rich is looking at the landscape, it it took Chimp out of the name of it. But, uh, it was, but in this paper, they still, they still yeah. call it Chadox here. Yeah. In this paper. And, the, and I think the reason they say NCoV-19 is because they also had a Chadox, the, uh, Chadox MERS and uh, earlier uh, a Chadox uh, influenza. I'm not sure exactly what that one was called, but yeah. yeah but NCoV is not even a thing anymore, right? It's either COVID-19 right. or SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> right. I don't know what they're talking about there. That's fine. But they also use live virus, which just drives me crazy, and I just keep quiet. Because I just think it's you should say why can't you say infectious? What is wrong with infectious uh, ne virus neutralization acid? Why do you have to say live for? Because it's what you've yeah. been thinking all your life. Anyway, so what do we got here? We have. Um, I'm going to go right to the results because they summarize it nicely. There's there's a lot of preliminary stuff. Good. Between April 23rd and May 21st, 1,077 participants enrolled in this study. They either got the vaccine, which is chimp adeno uh, with the spike, 543 people, or a meningococcus vaccine, 534 people called menACWI. I like that part of the trial, um, that the control was getting a different vaccine because then at least people maybe be get, may get some some side effects that may keep yeah. them blinded. And we can also see if it's a general immune boosting effect. Yeah. Right. So this is better than just giving PBS, right, where you wouldn't get any uh, if you wouldn't get any swelling or pain at the injection site or fever or whatever. And people would say, oh, but I got the able... control. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but- the, vac the meningitis vaccine is a conjugate vaccine, meaning that it has some polysaccharides from the outer coats of the bacteria mm -hmm. and actually four different ones, uh, four different men meningococcal strains, and that's conjugated to a tetanus toxoid. So it's not, uh, that's what I could glean from looking at about eight sources. <laughs> it's called Nemenrix. Uh, that's relatively different from this chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine. But since there aren't any chimpanzee adenovirus vaccines that are licensed, uh, this is what they could do. Yeah. And so then they had 10 people in a prime boost group where you would get a, you would get two immunizations, right? Just 10 people. Uh, median. Uh, so here's uh, an issue. Median age, 35 years. It ranged from 28 to 44 years of age. Um, half female and male, but the majority of participants were white. And they acknowledge these limitations later, right? There's no older people here, and you have to test it in older people if you hope to give it to them. Um, and you have to test it in other than white people who are healthy. But of course, in a phase one, you typically want healthy people, but later on, you have to diversify and uh, 
get people with comorbidities, right, if that's what you're going to use this in. But I suppose for this first trial, they wanted everything to, to turn out hunky-dory. So that's that. And also some people got paracetamol, right, to control pain and fever, I suppose. And Kathy, what's paracetamol? Well, I looked it up and the first thing said that it was a brand name. And But then I looked a little harder and it seems to be the British generic term for acetaminophen, yeah, right. which other people may know by the US brand name of Tylenol. And I'd, I'll swear it may have other brand names, but so it's something that reduces fever and reduces pain. So some of the people got paracetamol and some did not, right? That's the mm -hmm. way the trial was designed. It's um, interesting. All right. So so this, of course, is a phase one where they want to look at side effects. Fatigue and headache were the most commonly reported. Um, fatigue was reported in 70% of participants without paracetamol and 71 with in the uh, meningococcus group. And f uh, sorry, I, I got that wrong. Fatigue was reported in the Chadox group by 70% of participants without and 70% with. And the meningococcus group, 48% without and 46% with. So fatigue didn't wasn't impacted by paracetamol. Um, ne neither was headaches, apparently. Other systemic adverse reactions, muscle ache, and they break it down with and without paracetamol. It doesn't seem like the paracetamol is doing overall all that much. Feverish, maybe a little bit. That would be that would make sense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Chills, malaise, etc. Um, so those are the those are all common side effects, um, and that seems to be fine. Nothing serious. It does seem to have a little more in terms of those side effects than the meningococcal vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Kathy already pointed out that these aren't great matches for one another. Yeah. And so this these 10 people who got the prime boost got a second boost, got a booster at day 28. Um, and they say that those, the reactogenicity profile, that all these side effects, uh, for the second dose appeared less severe in this subset. But there's only 10 people, so it's hard to generalize. Um. Okay, antibodies. They measure just binding antibodies. That is, take serum from people and say what antibodies bind the spike protein. And in the immunized group, the antibodies peak by day 28. They remain elevated by day to day 56. And um, th and in participants who that's people who get one dose, and then they go up further um, in the 10 people who get a booster dose, which is what you would expect. These are just antibodies that bind the spike, right? Right. They go yeah, from exactly. a, a median of 157 for the people that just got the prime to a median of 639 for those that got the boost. So almost four so, times. Yeah, this is what we would expect, right? To uh, you put a mm -hmm. foreign antigen in people, they make antibodies against it. Yes, exactly. And if anyone um, who is not used to looking at uh, these types of data – happens to look at this figure, make sure that you notice that the y-axis is a log scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which figure are you looking at? I'm looking at figure three. Yeah, you know, I was thinking this morning, we, at some point we could share the, the figure screen because- Yeah, why not? On Zoom, but then that leaves out the people on the podcast only. So. What's more important, the data or the people? <laughs> <laughs> Trust the science, not the scientists, right? That's Dixon's line. Well, well we're digressed just a bit. Uh, in this figure, part B, and in the uh, uh, figure five, uh, the right-hand side, they show oh, some yes. convalescent plasma s samples. And we'll talk about what the data are, but I'm just going to say that they could have done a much better job of the presentation of the data. All right. So here's because, figure three. Right. Is that what you're so, talking about, right? Yeah, the B yeah. part. Because uh, not only is it hard to tell the asymptomatic from the severe, mm -hmm. um, they don't tell in this legend right below what the red asterisks are. They do say down below in the written legend what it is, yeah. but there's nothing on the on the x axis that's relevant. They could have spread all these data out yeah. in such a way that they weren't overlapping, and you could tell a filled square from a square with an x in it that looks pretty much like it's filled. 
Uh, so you could separate out the asymptomatic, mild, and severe on the x-axis, for example, right? That sure. Yeah. That'd be one way of doing it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the points they make is that here we have the prime, uh, the uh, antibodies that bind spike in the prime people and the prime boost. And, you know, they kind of fall in the middle range of this convalescent samples here, right? Right. Which is their way of saying, um, you know, it's similar to a natural infection, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And we know that convalescent plasma has been helpful um, in terms of transfer in some cases. So they kind of want to say, well, this is a, a useful amount of antibodies yeah. Yeah. Um, as well, yeah. which you can argue about whether that's <laughs> totally a great claim. But. Right. Uh, and then they move on to neutralizing. They use three different neutralization assays. Uh, they use um, uh, two assays Are you using. Gonna stop screen sharing, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up the. Oh, um, you're going to move, okay? <laughs> the other figure. Yeah, I can put it back up again. Sure. Uh, where are we? Lancet. Okay. So two, three different kinds of newts, right? They have two infectious virus neutralization assays, and w one of them done in Marburg, Germany which mm -hmm. threw me for a loop because they call it the Marburg virus neutralization assay. I'm saying, whoa, are they using a pseudotype Marburg virus? Why would they do that? <laughs> and last night I, at 10 p.m. I gave up trying to find the um, – and I put a note in, uh, can someone find it? And I knew Kathy would find it. <laughs> in the supplementary figure page, supplementary information page 32, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just another neutralization assay. And then the third one is a pseudotyped virus neutralization assay, which you could do anywhere. It doesn't need to be a cell three lab. Um, so here are the neutralization, the two using, um, the two assays using infectious SARS-CoV-2 um, in the prime and the prime boost. Um, uh, and you can see these are days since vaccination and they, they're, they're all over the place, right? <laughs> every, every patient is, is somewhat different. And, you know, these numbers are not Great. Look at one to sixty-four. So that's that dilution of one to sixty-four. That's the end of your neutralization, right? Uh, and the same here on the bottom, it goes up to two fifty-six. So they're not huge neutralization assays. And then here is the this pseudotype neutralization assay, um, which gives you higher titers. Interestingly, and they say they mention that somehow we have to standardize all this because. <laughs> You know, it is going up to over 1,024, so that means that a, you can get neutralization up to a dilution of 1,024, and so uh, I don't. that must be a function of the kind of neutralization assay, right? Because we saw in the other figure that it was lower using infectious SARS-CoV-2, which I would think is the more relevant, right? Right. So the, they, the bottom line is that they say that, in fact, I think they use three Three uh, infectious virus neutralizations and one non-infectious. Maybe that's what you said. Um, so they use four neutralization assays, and they all give the same overall take-home message result. Yeah. But they give different absolute numbers, and that if these, if this vaccine is going to be compared to another vaccine in a different trial, uh, this vaccine candidate is going to be compared to another candidate yeah. in another yeah. trial. That there's going to need to be a way to standardize these neutralization assays, uh, if that's what's yeah. reported, and that ends up being a critical thing. Here in this figure five, where they use the pseudotype virus for the neutralization, they also include the convalescent plasma samples to show you the range of neutralization titers that they get with the same pseudotype virus, right? So you can see uh, these vaccinated samples fall in the range of the convalescent plasma samples. Okay. Which is a pretty and big range. The, yeah, <laughs> it's at huge. The, at the very bottom is a box with, I think, an X in it, which yeah. is an asymptomatic uh, sample. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty hard to tell. Yeah. So let's keep with this uh, screen share. So you can see all my highlighting, which cues me about <laughs> what I'm supposed to talk about here. Um, these are all the neutralization assays. Interesting, one of the 98 participants had high titer neutralizing antibodies um, before vaccination. <laughs> mm -hmm. So presumably that was someone who was asymptomatically infected, right? Because I'm sure when you're enrolling for this trial, they ask you, have you ever had 
as COVID nineteen or yeah they uh, they say that they screen them for uh, uh, you're ineligible if you've had symptoms uh, consistent or if you've been PCR positive but that's going to miss out asymptomatic infections yeah yeah they had four percent had neutralizing antibodies or high ELISAs that were asymptomatic so yeah oh and let's not forget the T cell responses right Brianne of course <laughs> so they are they are measuring using a interferon gamma Ellis spot response. Mm -hmm. So they add peptides to, so they take, uh, tell us how this is done, uh, Brianne. Um, so what they do is they take some cells, um, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells or PBMCs. So basically immune cell, white blood cells from the blood. Um, and they put them in a well with some peptides um, from SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike, and then they look at the ability of those cells to produce interferon gamma. Yeah, and that's um, what's shown in this figure here, right? Yep, and so they're looking at interferon gamma production um, in response to those SARS-CoV-2 peptides, either after the prime or the boost. Mm -hmm. um, so this doesn't tell them if they're looking at CD4 or CD8 responses. Mm -hmm. um, but it does give us some idea that the T cells are um, able to make interferon gamma. Um, in the paper that we talked about last time, um, the Moderna vaccine trial, they measured their T cells using a different type of experiment. They used flow cytometry, um, which allowed them to look at a few different types of cytokines, not just interferon gamma. Mm. Um, and, um, if I remember correctly, some of the other cytokines um, actually gave them bigger responses in that paper. So I'd be interested to see um, other cytokines besides interferon gamma here. But this is certainly um, something that's given us some idea that the t there is a T-cell response. So for the antibodies, they do a neutralization, which is a functional assay, right? They say, okay, these antibodies induced by the vaccine can neutralize virus infectivity. But there's no such assay for the T-cell responses. Right. There, there sort of are some assays for T cell responses where you can look at the ability of cells to make cytokine um, or to um, kill uh, target cells. Right, but they're not um, done here. That's my point, right? Yeah, they're they're not done here in a way where we can sort of tease out exactly uh, which cells are acting and more details of their function. Now, you notice these graphs go out to 56 days, which is the limit of this preliminary report. Same thing for the antibodies, right? So we don't know mm -hmm. if these are going to wane. Now, last time when we talked about the Moderna vaccine, I said, we don't know if these are going to be durable. And then Rich said, well, Jason McClellan says that all antibody responses have to decline with time, right? Because you don't want to keep it high levels. And then I should have said, yes, but what we want to know is if they decline to zero or which would mean there's no memory B cells left, or to a very low level, which would suggest that there are some memory B cells around making a little bit of antibody. And that's what you would want, right? I forgot to say that last time. So again, it doesn't I, I don't need them to stay at high levels, but I want to see at some level, and we don't know because we have to go out further. And we'll know, presumably, when they continue this study, right? Exactly. And you have to listen to every episode of TWIV, otherwise you miss all these subtleties. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a tough one. And uh, <laughs> Hey, you know, we can't do everything all the time. <laughs> so to conclude this, a single dose, safe and tolerated, um, no serious adverse reactions. You A single dose gives you an increase in spike-specific uh, antibodies, um, and the, these are neutralizing. Uh, but they do say here, Although a correlative protection has not been defined for COVID-19. Same, same sentence in the Moderna paper. High levels of neutralizing antibodies have been shown in convalescent individuals with a wide range as confirmed of our study. I mean, okay, so, but we need to know what that means and are these important or not. And that's what I complain about all the time. We don't know if these are what are, are needed for protection. Maybe it's those T cells that get kind of not all the attention that they should. Right. And, and this is important because we're putting so many vaccines uh, sort of forward that are all making the same response. So if we're yeah. wrong about whether this is the important correlate of protection, um, we're going to be really wrong. Yeah. Uh, they also say here, and so they do say, they are accumulating data to suggest T-cell responses play an important role <laughs> in COVID mitigation. 
Um, but they do say here um, a boost in cell responses was not observed following the second dose, which they did in 10 people in this trial, consistent with the previous finding on viral vectored vaccines. Yeah, the concern with the vectored vaccines is always – uh, whether you have any pre-existing immunity to the vector or whether uh, immunity to the yeah. vector mounted during a one vaccination is going to compromise a boost. And basically, with this particular vector, and it's not true with all vectors, I'm thinking in particular of AD5, there doesn't seem to be a significant problem yet. yet. I wonder, you know, if you're going to put all of your childhood vaccines in a chimp had no vector whether by the time you get to the 10th one, your immune system will just go, forget it. I'm not dealing with that. Eh, probably long before <laughs> the 10th one, right? But I was thinking a lot. I was thinking about this and about the uh, apparent um, effectiveness. I mean, MVA is the same thing. That's the modified vaccinia Ancara. You can mm -hmm. apparently use that uh, repeatedly without a significant mm. uh, problem. How many times? Same as, uh, I'm not sure. Same is true with uh, AD26, the, uh, the vector that's being used uh, by Johnson & Johnson. That has a low seroprevalence in the population, and apparently what the existing seroprevalence is not a problem, and uh, revaccination is not a big problem. And I'm wondering why. And I, did you and I correspond about this, Kathy? I had correspondence with somebody about this. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm thinking that for non-replicating vectors, if there's really robust transgene expression, uh, it and and you don't induce by with your zero prevalence or with use of it before what would be sterilizing immunity, then the vector can still get in and start mm -hmm. cranking out uh, antigen. Yeah. And so maybe pre-existing immunity in many cases is not an issue. Yeah. Well, I guess well, it depends, right? Well, maybe it would be pre-existing immunity that the vaccine induces. But if you somehow had gotten a chimp ad infection earlier in your life, that pre-existing immunity would still matter. Uh, uh, they, uh, there are people around with chimp ad infections. Okay. And I believe I've read that they've actually done studies on those and they're not a problem. Hmm. Same with, uh, and I think it's even said somewhere here in this paper, same with ad 26, ad 26 was chosen, I think among other things, it was because there's a low zero prevalence in the U S but the people who uh, do have, uh, antibodies to ad 26, I don't think are, uh, uh, respond significantly worse than those who are zero negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, it may depend some on the, on the vector, but it makes sense to me. And I mean, I was thinking that if you had um, uh, serum antibodies that were such that when your immune system just saw the virus at all, it would squash it. That would be sterilizing immunity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and that would uh, compromise the effectiveness of the vector. But if you don't have sterilizing immunity and the virus can actually get in and establish a primary infection, it's these vectors don't replicate anyway. Yeah. Okay? Now all you got is a piece of DNA that's making protein. Now, true, some of those proteins are adenovirus proteins. I suppose if you've got T cell immunity to the vector, it could. Um, mm, compromise over time the effectiveness of uh that cell it could kill that cell but if you got antigen production that is robust sufficiently robust and quick enough maybe none of that pre-existing immunity is a problem i'm, uh, I'm making it, this up it depends okay, on whether it's saying. sterilizing or not i know that in the yeah. early uh, trials of of s replacing cystis six cystis cystis <sighs> CF genes with adenovirus <laughs> vectors. After two administrations, there was no more transgene expression due to uh, antibody against the vector. So, uh, uh, really yeah, and certainly uh, with a lot of uh, this has been a big issue with uh, adeno-associated virus yeah. uh, gene therapy. That's right. There's immunity to the to the vector. Yeah. So, and so that's it's something that needs to be thought about. But I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's a a, a showstopper all Not the always. time. I agree. The cystic fibrosis, that's how to say that's it. That's it. All right. Cu lastly, a couple of limitations they note. Small number of participants in the prime boost group. Study findings not easily generalizable as it's a first study of fairly young, healthy, and white volunteers. And nobody with comorbidities or nobody older, nobody in ethnically and geographically diverse populations. And they say these people are being uh, recruited now. 
uh, for further studies in the UK and overseas. And phase three are actually underway already in Brazil, South Africa, and the UK. So, and folks, uh, I this... looked up those studies. There's a total of like 12,000 people, 2,000 in Brazil. Are there separate trials? The one in Brazil, I think, and the one in the uh, UK and South Africa. And, um, a total of 12,000 individuals. And uh, in these trials, there is an expanded age range. They're getting older people. Yeah. Also, uh, they point out that immunogenicity of a CHADOX-1 vectored vaccine, and here I have the name of it now, CHADOX-1 NPL plus M1 is the name of it, um, against influenza, those two proteins, the NP and the M1, mm. has been shown in older adults from 50 to 78 years of age. And so I looked up that paper. Uh, the first author is our friend Linda Cullen. And uh, it was given alone or in combination with the MVA vaccines to uh, 24 subjects aged 52 to 78 with a mean of 61 and a half years. So there's some precedent for this chimpanzee adenovirus vaccine being given at least. Mm. I really like the uh, screen share, Vincent. Uh, I think it, uh, uh, among other things, because I think it really helps emphasize how to read papers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we true. always talk about the figures and that kind of stuff, but uh, that really demonstrates how you read the paper. And I think that's, a, that's important. You know, these, these, these papers are not like reading a novel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, no, if, if I screen shared a lot of the papers I read, um, you know, people would see my notes covering, you know, all over the paper mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that it's not just uh, something that I sit and read easily. Right. Yeah. When I get PDFs, sometimes you get a PDF that you can't highlight. I, I can't, I can't deal with it because I can't remember <laughs> what to talk about you, later. You can, you can print it out and then do this. <laughs> <laughs> the old fashioned that, way. Do you have a printer at or, home? Yeah. Wow. Of course I do. I, yeah. I don't. Um, so, uh, are we done with that? Cause I, have, uh, I, uh, while you guys have been yakking, I did my homework on the Pfizer vaccine. Go ahead. So if you, uh, scan up in the document, I got a little green there and a link below it. Okay. So they've actually published, uh, on July 1st, well published, they've posted on med archive, mm -hmm. uh, the results of a phase one trial. Okay. So the uh, the vaccine is called BNT six one sixty two B one, okay. Like all these vaccines, just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> okay, uh, it is a lipid nanoparticle. All right. So in that respect, it's uh, similar to um, uh, the Moderna vaccine, mm -hmm. but as we've already described, it's just the uh, receptor binding domain. Uh, this trial was of a uh, phase, they call it phase one slash two. There may be more to it than what's uh, reported here. Uh, but in this particular report, it's uh, similar to the phase one trial uh, of the Moderna vaccine. 45 subjects uh, aged uh, 18 through 55 in a prime boost protocol, prime boost Dose escalation protocol. Uh, the dose escalation is 10, 30, and 100 micrograms. And for reference, the Moderna optimum dose, uh, the Moderna trial went up to 250 micrograms. And I think they decided that 250 was overkill mm -hmm. and maybe a uh, little on the adverse effect side. Yep. Uh, not, not bad, but not great. Uh, and so Moderna has settled on uh, 100 micrograms. Not that these are directly uh, comparable. Uh, and they measured uh, safety, and just to summarize, like most of these others, it was uh, deemed safe. Here's the figure, um, by the way, Rich, on the screen. Yep, okay. Safety. Uh, they looked at uh, ribosome-binding domain antibody, uh, and they looked at neutralizing titers, okay? And the neutralization assay is, okay. I don't think they did uh, T-cells. Uh, but I went, I went through this pretty quick. The neutralization assay, I'm, I'm interested in these, and this is an interesting one. They have made a, uh, green virus. Where is that? Where some is sort that? of fluorescent protein. Where is that? In, uh, it was B, um, right there. 
Okay, neutralization, fifty percent serum neutralization. Tide using a fluorescent virus, you say? Yeah, they've taken a SARS-CoV-2 and um, cloned a green fluorescent, a fluorescent protein of some sort into it, and they refer to another paper saying that uh, it has minimal effects on its ability to form plaques, and it um, <clears throat> uh, the growth kinetics are the same with this virus, and that allows them to uh, infect cells in a ninety-six well format. Uh, and after a relatively short uh, incubation, uh, use, a, I guess, a fluorescence plate reader to not only do cell counts, but look at for foci of virus infection. That's how they do their neutralization test. My guess is that's a, a, a little quicker, maybe. Uh, and at any rate, they uh, see uh, an appropriate um, uh, antibody response uh, using the both the uh, ELISA to the ribosome binding domain antibody mm-hmm. and receptor. Important, receptor. importantly, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, receptor binding domain and importantly, uh, the virus neutralization. Okay, mm-hmm. so they are getting the this serum uh, neutralizes virus and it's apparent. Uh, I just had a quick look at it, but it, it looks to me like the boost, once again, is important uh, as in the Moderna vaccine. So we have 10 micrograms, 30. And interestingly, at 100 micrograms, you get lower neutralized I w- titers. I was looking at that. They That's actually 21 days. They don't show the 28-day data. I wonder why. Yeah, because at 21, they're all low. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then um, we have our convalescent they- serial here, too. You can see the same spread as in the other paper. Yeah. Strangely enough, they have 100 micrograms at 28 days in part A of this figure. Yeah. That's just the binding antibodies there right yeah right. and okay. that uh, yeah and i okay. think that 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 is specifically looking at uh that's using as a, a an antigen in the elisa the ribosome binding domain itself uh, so looking just for those antibodies but i think it's really important relative to our previous discussion that they are seeing uh, new, uh, uh serum neutralization at well, least pfizer bioentech uh manuscript that you just showed us is in mm-hmm. med archive med it's archive. not yet right. peer reviewed i yes. wasn't sure if you said that well if i were on the on the warp speed committee and i'm not i'm not on any committee <laughs> I, actually i'm on my town's committee to try and open schools in the fall um i would not recommend paying 1.6 billion or whatever 1.9 billion for this because it's redundant with moderna and i'd we i'd diversify frankly into something else but they didn't ask me. So there you go. All right, let's do some email. So after last week's twibs, it's just pouring in even more. And I mean, I thought it was pretty pouring as it was. And um, Michael Mina's episode got a lot of response. Um, even Malcolm Gladwell tweeted that twiv. Interestingly, not the Tony Fauci twiv, which I think was also cool, but... Of course, the MENA is kind of game-changing. So lots of people wrote uh, asking what they can do, and Michael has been going back and forth with us. We're going to try and come up with some plan. I mean, at the at one easy level, we have a couple of letters here that people have written uh, to send to your senators, representatives, elected officials, whatever. And I'm thinking of making a page where we put them all so people can copy parts of each one that they want and send them off to their elected officials or whatever. And I think the key is to be brief and bullet pointed, right? Because you can't give them a link to Twiv and say, go listen, because they're not going to do that. No. And you have to make it a one message letter. Yes. It has to be one message. We need rapid one buck. A buck a, a, buck a test, someone called it. Yeah. Don't don't throw in climate change, right? No, write a separate right. letter for, about that. <laughs> yeah, somebody uh, so, uh, made a YouTube video um, of clips yeah, that's, from that's that med, episode, med, along med with drawings. Med yep, cram, med cram. Yeah, yeah. Um, that so, yeah. is really nice if you're trying to just get a shorter version of the message to people. So med cram did what I have always wanted to do, but I have only me doing the production here. Med cram has a staff of people. And they're very widely listened to by docs and medical students because they come out very frequently with stuff with lots of great graphics. And I just can't do that. I, I thought after the, the Michael episode, hey, I think next week I'll make some clips and I still haven't gotten around to it. This is a YouTube uh, compilation of that TWIV episode? Yeah, they took pieces, yeah. pieces of it and... 
they did uh, illustrations. Did. They send, made some nice graphics. Yeah, or put yeah, put the link in the show notes. Yeah, actually, Johnny right. Ballinger just sent uh, the link. What did I do with that? Did I put it down below? Or did I, I sent it to you guys on Slack today? Yeah, go check. It's in oh. Slack. It's in. Right, Slack. I'm putting it in the show notes in a second too. Okay. So, uh, as you've said, we probably want to do some follow up on this, but I found the uh, Rockefeller Foundation. Um, uh, they call it their COVID-19 testing and tracing action plan. At yeah. least interesting. I haven't looked into it in any detail. Uh, we might want to discuss that in some more detail sometime. We could put a link in the show notes. I put it right here uh, in the yeah. document. But for all of you who are writing about this, um, you know, Michael is going to work with us to somehow come up with a plan. I mean, I think part of the solution is you have to write people. You have to get people to listen to his episode, spread it around as much as you can. And, you know, it's noticed now by MedCram, it's noticed by Gladwell, and it's got to be noticed by more people, the movers and shakers of the world, because once they see it and listen, it, they're going to say, wow, this is a game changer. Yeah. What I liked was uh, when you guys brought it up uh, to Tony Fauci, uh, he said, well, maybe not something exactly like that. But then he proceeded to say something that's pretty much pretty exactly yeah. like what Michael Minnett talked about. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. But yeah, I put his it summer, in the show notes. His summary was, "Don't let what was it? Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good." Yes. Yep. Okay. This is one of yeah. our show title candidates yes. here today. Uh, yeah. I used it as a subject line in an email that I sent to some people. So, yeah. All right. So let me take the first two short ones. One is from Mark. TWIV is well ahead of the national conversation on meaningful COVID-19 information slash perspectives. Keep up the great work. You and the team are making a real impact. And Charles uh, writes, thanks for the reading. Here is a link with a picture. He sends a picture. So he, Charles wrote the limerick about Tony Fauci that we read last time. There was once a new virus plight. And anyway, he puts it on a picture of Tony sitting in, in somewhere in the White House, ready to go talk, I guess, to... Talk, uh, the, the president. And if you look closely, I think in this picture too, you can see his crazy socks. He's got crazy yeah. socks? Yeah. Yeah. What kind of crazy socks does he have? They're stripes, multicolored stripes. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. All right. Um, Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Barbara writes Dear Vincent, the show with Dr. Fauci was very well done. I have watched it twice. Brilliant. It was interesting to witness the relationship history among the three of you, your collective passion as scientists, knowledge, experience, expertise, and equally important, your humility, empathy, humanity. Most impressive. I have so much respect for each of you. Question, how is it that China has coasted at around uh, 81 to 3,000 cases since March? Their line is completely flat, and there has been very little in the news about Wuhan second waves. Perhaps they are doing something right we can learn from. Or, thank you in the TWIV team for your great work. There are a few of us in my circle who follow and discuss the show regularly. We are not scientists. We are artists, computer programmers, writers, teachers. You may also be interested to know that Malcolm Gladwell, a brilliant Canadian author, is also a fan. I heard him mention TWIV during a CBC interview back in March or April. So cool. And don't worry, we are not fair weather listeners. As you said in one of the shows around 600, there are lots of cool other viruses out there. We can't wait to hear about them. My best, Barbara. Um, I agree, Barbara. That was a fabulous episode. Great job, Vincent and Rich. So China, yeah, uh, they've got a, a robust, much more than we could ever accomplish, I think. Uh, system of testing and tracking, mm -hmm. uh, contact tracing. They wear masks. Yep. Okay. So it's all about uh, it's all about the science, and it's all about a a, a, a uh, uh, the leadership is a different sort of leadership there, but nevertheless, it's leadership. Okay. Um, and you know, getting the population to cooperate. Uh, in uh, testing and tracing and uh, staying away from people and keeping from spreading it around. They don't that's, have people saying, I'm not wearing a face mask. No. No, they're they all buying into it. They don't have people saying, I don't want to be traced. Okay? Yep. I mean, can you imagine 
uh, electronic contact tracing, individual contact tracing here in the U.S., what sort of a, what sort of a pushback you get from that? Forget it. You know, we're all in this together, dudes. You know, speaking of science, t- last week the White House um, spokesperson, she said, we want all schools open fully in the fall, and we don't want the science to interfere with that. Yeah. Oh, ah! my gosh. Ugh. That is the summary of the whole situation. Yeah. <sighs> I didn't hear that. Yeah, I just want to was... bring, this, bring this back. Um, Barbara is part of River Road Creative, and uh, it's a group that does writing and funding proposals relative to COVID-19 for businesses. So uh, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Let's uh, spread the word, uh, get everybody to listen. More people is important because I think we're doing something that's pretty unusual and cool and informative. Um, but we, we appreciate your support. Um, Kathy. Sure. Lewis writes, hi, Vincent and Twivers dudes. <laughs> the interview with Bernie Moss blew me off my shoes. What a character. Amazing. What an interview. It's a must-see for all. Amazing. A bright mind. <laughs> the only word I can express is thank you. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. It's okay. It just it's just, out. I mean, uh, this is great because, yeah, it's hard stuff. And then someone wrote on YouTube, you throw out a lot of acronyms and stuff. Yeah, but, you know, it can be fun. So hard stuff can be fun. Try it. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't just have to wash over you, right? And entertain right. you. It can be fun to use it's your brain. It's fun to learn things. It is fun to learn things. Um, and listening to people who are excited about it, this can be fun too, right? It's infectious. Yeah. Oops. Um, <laughs> I just uh, I just uh, rewatched the very uh, intro of that. I haven't had time to look at the whole thing again. I will want to do that. But um, I was reminded during, uh, through that that Bernie has been at the NIH for 54 years. I know. I had forgotten that. That's amazing. And you know damn well he's going to die with his boots on <laughs> <laughs> and a pipette in his hand. So someone on YouTube said, you know, I hear this, these New York accents, Vincent and Bernie, and then all of a sudden Condit booms in with his Texas. They called you a Texas accent, right? Uh-oh. <laughs> no, no, it's a California accent. Te- it's a California accent. Yeah, you, you don't have a Texas accent. What's with- Rich, can you take the next one? Rebecca writes, hello, wise ones of TWIV. Love all your super smarty pants people on this amazing show. Very interested in the show with Michael Mina and the one buck test as an efficient and cheap substitute for the PCR test for possible use in widespread testing. When you say the current PCR test is too sensitive in the sense that it is picking up a level of virus, uh, I want to correct that right away, RNA. Mm -hmm. that is not actually infectious virus, does this imply that reports uh, of the 65,000-plus infections detected today in the U.S. would include lots of people who are not, in fact, infectious? It could be, of course, that they will be infectious in a few days or in a week's time, but perhaps not. What's the evidence? What is... What evidence is there that one can contract the virus at low levels and never actually spread it? I'm curious in part because my institution is inducing, introducing a testing program where 25% of the campus will be tested each week, so everyone once a month. Is this going to be uh, the standard PCR test? Uh, it seems both too much and too little. What do you think? Keep up the brilliant conversations. Rebecca. P.S. Did Dixon do the nice picture of the virus sitting on the table behind Vincent mm-hmm. in ex- episode 642? No, I think it's the quilt <laughs> like Kathy has. It? Uh, it's, it's sitting on a couch because 642 was recorded in uh, my Columbia office. And what Kathy is showing now is what I have on my couch that was made by uh, Jolene Ramsey's mom, right? Yeah, I got one too. Yeah, we all got one. We Very all cool. went to yep. uh, we have this Texas thing on the back yep. Center for Phage Technology. It's very cool. I, people notice it all the time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Rebecca, you are uh, appropriately tuned into this. Yeah. the uh, The bottom line is that there are probably people who are positive in the PCR test, 
uh, who are not infectious. Okay. And I think the details on this, uh, Mina's paper, I, I, I too am still sort of, uh, tuning into this. Mina's paper is, uh, largely a theoretical paper based on what's known about the relationship, what's known in the literature about the relationship between infectious virus uh, and PCR tests. But the bottom line is that there are probably a lot of people who are positive in the PCR test, in particular, right before they become infectious mm -hmm. and perhaps for a fairly long time after they become infectious, uh, they have been infectious. Yeah. Uh, people who are positive in the PCR test who don't have uh, a lot or even any infectious virus and therefore are not infectious individuals. Um, so uh, uh, I would say that that's the extent of the evidence that um, there are people who, um, uh, you know, uh, are PCR positive and non-infectious. I, my guess is that there's a fairly large population. Let's see here. The individual questions uh, were good here. Uh, does that imply that reports of 65,000 infections tested today would include lots of people that are not, in fact, infectious? Yes. Exactly. But remember, this is a dynamic situation. Yeah. If you're PCR positive today, a week from now, you may not be, or two weeks, you may not be, okay? It's a, it's a moving target. And unfortunately, everyone's not getting tested. So that right. also doesn't include all the people who are infectious but haven't been tested. Uh, it says She says, it could be, of course, they will be infectious in a few days or a week's time. Now, if you're PCR positive uh, on the uh, front side of an infection, uh, uh, the infection ramps up really fast. I don't mm -hmm. think you're going to sort of um, necessarily peter along for a long period of time pcr positive and not be infectious okay there's probably only a window of a, a day or so that's for on before the front end and the front end yeah pcr positive before you're actually infectious yeah, yeah. but i think it, the, the the trailing end could be uh, go out longer. yeah for sure um uh what evidence is there that one can contract the virus at low levels and never actually spread it i don't know that there's any evidence one way or another we know that there there are people who contract the virus. We're, have we seen people who were never actually, there was that one paper that we did that had a whole bunch of people who were not antibody positive, but were T cell positive. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And I forget whether some of those were, I think some of those were actually PCR negative. Okay. And I, my guess is that if you're PCR negative, you're not going to be transmitting no. virus. No. So it wouldn't surprise me if there are people out there who uh, do a, a really lightweight hit and run, okay, uh, and are never really seriously infected. Of course, this is it's all a matter of numbers, too. I mean, some people are going to have higher titers of virus uh, than other. Now, on your campus, my guess is that it's a PCR test, yep, okay, because sure. that's the most common test used. Now, I've, I've over the last week, uh, done some research into the different types of uh, testing that are out there. And there are some tests that are now FDA approved uh, that they have emergency use authorization uh, that are uh, antigen, uh, fluorescent antigen tests. Um, I don't, they are not as sensitive. I don't, uh, they, I don't know that they'd be used on campus. My guess is the campus test that's being used is a PCR test. I'm not sure that that's a, once a month is of any value, actually. Nope. nope. It's not enough. It's going to give you, you know, a little bit of an idea of the prevalence. Yeah, the population of, in, side, uh, but of disease uh, in, in the population you're studying, but it's not frequently enough no. to really exert any control. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I'd have to see what they were doing in terms of things like contact tracing, um, in addition to positives and things like that. That might help a little if they're going to test contacts of those positives, but even so, this is a, a, a tough. Yeah, uh, from what Michael Minna said, it, you know, it, the contact tracing isn't really worth doing. By the time that they're going to come up positive, yeah, they're they're already almost past being contagious. Um, I, I think it has to be close to every day, as close to every other, as close to every day as you can afford it. That's every other What's day. Or at whatever. least twice a week. Two or three yeah. times okay. a week. Okay. And, sure. uh, and the results have to be essentially instantaneous. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. No, that's, I mean, that totally changes everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were, we were struggling with PCR and accuracy and all. Every day test, it, cheap, fast, that's it. In some cases, 
uh, in a lot of cases now, I think uh, people are uh, getting uh, the standard PCR test and not getting their results for another week. I mean, at that yeah, point, Daniel it's useless. Daniel gave an example last week where he had a patient with had a PCR test and the result didn't come in for 10 days. He said, I was embarrassed to call him and tell him, yeah, you were COVID positive and probably spreading infection to others, right? That's It's just no good that it takes so long. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem with for, PCR. For a review, you can listen to the first hour of TWIB 640. <laughs> or what we think should happen. Or you can I, listen to the med cram. Right. Yeah, Are I'm they going to summarize that. all our twivs now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Peter writes, dear twiv, I'm the former executive VP of ALZA, the former executive director of the Stanford University Medical Center, the former chairman of AMFAR, and a former ARPA project manager. Your podcasts are the best single source of information on COVID. Thank you. Now, this is a person who knows something. Listen up, folks. Well, you're already listening. Tell everybody to listen. <laughs> I've just contributed to TWIV and would be pleased to contribute more. And then he sends an email that he sent to his friends. Subject, why is California failing so badly to stop SARS-CoV-2 virus? And he gives a graph of cases uh, with time. Uh, from like March to July, it keeps and it's just increasing total cases. And his reasons are one, lack of personal responsibility. We took a long walk this morning. 60% of the pedestrians were not wearing masks. This is now in California, I assume. And 100% of the runners who pose a much greater threat to others because of their high volume and rate of expiration uh, were not wearing masks. Uh, exhaling, I would say. Expiration sounds bad. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope that the runners do not all expire. Well, but it's it's inspiration and expiration. I know, yeah. I know, but on its own, it sounds like they're all dying. Right? All right, through lack of leadership, when was the last time you heard any local official except Anna Eshu speak out, speak loudly, and speak clearly about what we all have to do to stop this virus? Three, lack of strong, clear, consistent messaging. Where are the TV ads, newspaper ads, banners and signs exhorting all of us to do what we need to do to stop this killer? For lack of testing and contact tracing, California has the second largest number of cases in the U.S. and ranks 14th in the rate of testing. In many ways, this virus is an IQ slash EQ slash economic status test, and Darwin will prevail. Uh, this is a really nice letter. I appreciate the... Uh compliment the support of TWIV. That's good. And I think his point number three, lack of a strong, clear, consistent messaging is important because I wonder now, I, I wonder how people get their information. Okay. And with what frequency, because I'm, I, I am probably weird because I read uh, the New York times and the Washington post, <laughs> and I'm constantly scanning uh, websites, okay, for uh, the the latest, I mean, official websites, you know, like this uh, Travis County public uh, health site, uh, and, uh, and digging to see what the current recommendations are uh, for uh, Austin. Uh, beyond that, you know, I spend some time on Facebook. I don't watch commercial television. I watch public television. Uh, oh, and we get the local paper. But if you walk around in the morning, there's only 10% or at most of people who get the local hard copy paper. And I have a hard time believing that everybody's spending all the time on the New York Times and the Washington Post that I am. Where are people getting their information? In particular, local news, okay, that Facebook. says what you ought to be doing where you are. Facebook. That's yeah, not, it's not good. I know it's not good, but that's where a lot of people good. get it. Yeah. For sure. It's not good. So that so there there has to be some way of messaging people consistently uh, to tell them this is the story today. Okay. You know, like everybody ought to get a text message to remind them to put on their mask <laughs> today and show them what, what the effect is and tell them what the regulations are. That I could think happen. people are doing, they're doing the best they can, but that could happen you know, from the top down, from the president's office down. That could have happened months ago consistent, clear messaging, but we didn't get it. We got the wrong message. But you can imagine another administration coordinating all of this, not just face mask wearing, but 
the the messaging, maybe setting up a text network for everyone where you, you get a message from the president every day saying, here's what we have to do. That could have happened. It did public and service, you, public service announcements. And you don't have to imagine it because in other countries, that kind of messaging is yeah. out and people yeah. are doing yeah. that. Um, uh, just one other thing. I, I forgot to make sure it made it into the notes, but uh, Bowden sent us something and I forwarded it to Vincent. Uh, so maybe we can count it as kind of a listener pick of the week. I pasted it at the bottom. It's a YouTube kind of a competition showing uh, UM Coach, University of Michigan coaches and MSU coaches uh, kind of being competitive. But the bottom line for, from all of them is wear a mask. It's 30 seconds long. You know, you get those out there from people in all walks of life giving that message, then it's going to hit a lot more people that hear it from their favorite coach or their favorite rock star or whoever. I, I remember what I forgot earlier. So when I read a newspaper article, I immediately look for the link to the paper. I don't bother reading the article. I don't want to know their interpretation. I want to see the paper. And you should do the same thing. Go to the articles. They often link to it. Not always. But if they don't, you can search for it. Look at the original article and see if they're making accurate uh, commentary on it. Likewise, I bet that when you read a paper, you read a couple of lines, but then you're focused on the data. Always look you scan through and, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what are the data? I don't care what they say about it. Well, I do. But I, what I mostly care about is what are the data? And, and if you can't find the paper, um, that might be a bad sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If there is no paper, then I don't really, I'm not interested in, in, a, in a newspaper article about some finding that's not published. I'm, I don't, it's not real to me. By the way, even papers or preprints, can have issues. I saw one last week where the title was this vaccine candidate induces sterilizing immunity, I think in mice. And then the data, the summary of the data was these data show that the vaccine does not introduce induce sterilizing immunity. What the hell? Can't you proofread? Yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> um okay, uh, Brienne, you're next. All right. Barbara writes, "Hello Twiv. I've been making cloth masks at home for all of my friends and coworkers. I just purchased cool glow in the dark Halloween cloth, and I plan to start making masks for the holiday season as well. I know we're going to be using them until at least Valentine's Day. Do you think we'll be touting pastel masks come spring 2021? Um, I'll tell you, masks are the new fashion statement. Okay? Yes, they are. I think so. I think, yeah, the spring too. I think so. <clears throat> I, I think, think glow in the dark Halloween masks is just awesome. I think that's great. I think I want to glow in the dark Halloween mask. And I think I will probably wear a pastel mask next spring um, because even if the vaccine is done and ready to go, I don't know if every person in the United States will be able to get a dose by then. And even if it is ready, if only 50% effectiveness, then that leaves you half of the people who get vaccinated still susceptible. So, yeah, I think we're going to be wearing masks and they're going to get cooler and cooler. I forgot to bring my twiv mask i have to i'll show it to you on friday i got a couple uh yeah and i know rich is going to have a pick sometime about uh fabric that you can get that's virus right. there's a bunch of different virus uh patterns from one company so Am? didn't you i thought you picked that no you got that from somebody else okay i, I thought you had dibs on that one well it's <laughs> the company is spoon flower um, that's all yours okay so yeah, and I and I got some of them, but I didn't get the uh, a specific virus one uh, yet. So, Kathy, you're next. Okay, uh, Charles writes. Following is what I'm going to send my GOP senators. Any suggestions? If others would like to use it as a template, go for it. P.S. I really like Dr. Fauci's comment at thirteen eighteen and six forty one. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And then he has his letter pasted in here, and I did not. Uh, read it, but um, and then he at the bottom he has a couple of links um, to like Dr. Fauci. Go to the 13 minute mark. Dr. Minna, all of it's really good, but if you're in a hurry, skip to the 22 minute mark. And so that that could be helpful. Um, and probably you know for Dr. Fauci or your congressperson, it's going to be some aid. Um, and so they might actually scrub to that point, and it, it could be useful. So. I mean, I think this is a good start. We'll put this, I'll make a page 
with all the letters, as I said, and we'll link to it in the show notes. Um, and, um, you know, people can make put together their own letters. Um, we have one other that we'll look at, and, but there are many more that people are sending, so I'll put them there. But I think, you know, important, as Kathy said earlier, you sh- should focus on one point, and if you can, make some bullet points because they like to see those uh, kinds of summaries. Um, but this is a good start, and, and as he said... Um, I mean, here, this is a good point. Bottom line, we need Congress to get involved in pushing funding warp speed active to develop SARS-CoV-2 testing that can be performed by untrained or minimally trained personnel without special equipment with saliva, 10 minutes, $1. This is not pie in the sky. We are at war with SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, uh, yeah when you think, I think occasionally about the what the United States and other countries did when there was a genuine war going on, World War One and World War Two, yeah, yeah, where he shifted the entire nation's attention to addressing something like this, and it's uh, amazing to think what can be accomplished if you do that. Oh, th- this is absolutely the case. You shouldn't say we can't do this or we can't do that. We aren't able. That's nonsense. You can. There is no try. There is just do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Yoda. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, by the way, the other uh, quote from that Fauci thing that I really liked was when he said uh, he uh, sort of paused at one moment when I asked one of us asked him a question, one of the many questions where he didn't have an answer. OK, and he says, I don't know. And he said, you know, it's amazing because you say, I don't know. And they say, what's your best guess? And you give them your best guess. And then later on, they come back and they say, you were wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I remember that. That's how science works, dudes. That's, uh, you know, maybe that, maybe that lesson can get uh, sink in. Rich, you're next. Oh my goodness. It's Lisa. Uh, Lisa. Uh, Lisa writes, dear Twiv, sorry to clog up your inbox. <laughs> Not at all, Lisa. Attached is uh, in the final version of a le- is the final version of a letter that people can oh people can send to their local state and federal representatives insisting that the government immediately license manufacture and distribute millions of rapid one buck at home covid-19 tests i think that i'm going to send the letter to everyone i know not just politicians and ask people to share it with everyone they know I'm also going to specifically ask my friends with school-aged children to forward the letters to teachers, principals, school board members, and teacher union representatives. My friend uh, Maureen and I wrote the letter. If you'd like to make any changes, please please feel free. If there are changes uh, that you'd like me to make in the letter, please let me know. Thanks for your podcast, Best Lisa. And she gives a link to her letter. I haven't uh, I haven't looked at it. It's a good letter. It's got a lot of bullet points, um, and and it's written. So that you can fill okay. in, you know, where depending on where you are, uh, license or authorize different words. Um, maybe there are too many bullet points. I don't know. Could be a little shorter. But it, again, it's a good way to get ideas for your own letter. I'm certainly going to put together uh, one of mine and put it in all the places I can think of and send it to everyone. And I think if we all do that, you know, just the TWIV listeners can make an impact. As someone else wrote um, – you know, can we use the TWIV listenership to do something? And yes, we can. I mean, it's not huge, but we can amplify it. And I think all of you can start doing that by crafting letters, put them on social media, put them wherever you want. Um, and put it. Yeah, on- maybe you ought to have a separate, uh, sorry, Vincent, maybe you ought to have a separate uh, menu tab with letters to, you know, I don't know what you would call it, but where you could put all these, it's easily accessible. So you think it should be a Google sheet, Kathy, and not a web page um, instead? Well, no, I, I, it shouldn't be editable. It right. shouldn't no, be that's editable. that's fine. That's fine, yeah. Right. But uh, a web page would not be, but a Google sheet you can make not edit. Well, what's preferable? Um, a Google well, sheet? something that they can download it and then they can edit it. But you don't want the original that Lisa wrote yeah, yeah. to get changed by the first three people that No, no, of go course not. No, no. But uh, I, I, I will... I yeah. mean, I know the the hundred scientists thing that we talked about was a Google sheet with names that can't be right. edited, and right. I could put these texts in a Google sheet, a doc that could be shared, or it could be a web page. You can copy and download it either way. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Brian writes, "Thanks for all the team does. You're a treasure." First, Churchill may have said, "If you find yourself in hell, keep going." Harry <laughs> Truman said, "I just tell the truth, and they think it's hell." <laughs> 
<laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> now to a minor issue. Vincent points out correctly that little selection force exists to modify SARS-CoV-2. I know this is done to correct popular misconceptions. There's another misconception, not COVID-related, that Vincent's statement may accidentally promote. Many educated in the pre-genomics era learned natural selection is synonymous with Darwinian evolution. Vincent's point that selection isn't going to drive change in this virus may encourage the all-powerful selection view. Researchers like Lynch and Kunin demonstrate that genetic drift and complexification are very common in the history of life, especially with eukaryotes, but with all life and viruses too. Evolution without selection is no misnomer. It's frequent. What about SARS-CoV-2? It's got that proofreading exonuclease. More importantly, given 15 million global cases, if each contributes 10 million virions, that's 10 to the 15th total. That's too large a population for selection to act. At which I will come back to. I think that's correct. Drift could happen, which takes time. It could get more or less virulent, less or more adapted to lower high pH, more likely something inconsequential. Thank you. And please don't take this as criticism. I'm sure you are aware of these factors and just wanted to clear the air of mutation fever. For some, the takeaway might have been that only selection causes evolution. I've been wrong about many things with this virus, about masks, about test sensitivity. I have one complaint about Tony Fauci. He said in February he did not recommend masks because he was worried about essential worker shortages. The research back then did not support mask use. It would have been better had he admitted that he was the consensus then and he was wrong. Then George Gao told Science the most important thing Europe and U.S. did wrong was masks. I fear Dr. Fauci can't mention this because he would be attacked. He and we were schooled by the head of China's CDC, also a member of the U.S. Academy of Sciences. This China conflict needs repair if we plan on tackling climate change or dealing with most problems. So, yes, I think that everyone should say I was wrong. I made a mistake including the president who now is saying it's patriotic to wear face masks. He should say, I was wrong not to recommend them. He will never say that. But I think if he did, then it would convince a lot of people to wear face masks now. I mean, here we here I also, on, Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. I also think it's important, once you have said that, to move forward. Don't yes, linger on it. For sure. Okay? Move forward. I mean, it's okay to be wrong. Okay? Yep. Just move on. Uh, and now with the drift idea, I, I, I completely agree. There doesn't have to be selection for everything. Uh, mutations can be introduced that have some effect, and they can propagate through the population. As long as they're neutral, right, and they don't have a negative fitness cost on the virus, I think that can happen. And so, yes, a mutation might arise that would increase transmissibility without it being selected. But at some point, of course, it's going to propagate through the population by selection, for sure, and that may be what has happened, but there's no evidence for it, and that's my point. But you're absolutely right. These things can happen randomly. It's not all about selection. Uh, however, with viruses, selection is very powerful, and that's why we have influenza viruses changing every year, selected by antibody and T cells in immune people. Now, you say that too large a population of viruses for selection to act, but selection acts in an individual, maybe even at a cell level. So a virus survives antibody neutralization in one person and is then transmitted to another and another and another. So it begins in just one person. You don't have to select on the whole population of virus particles. That's how I look at it. But I appreciate intelligent conversation for sure. Uh, and, and actually, uh, what comes to mind as you discuss that is HIV because there's HIV going uh, evolution or selection going on in every in every infected individual yes for sure the mm -hmm. population shifts based on the uh, selection Im imposed by the um, uh, the immune response right and as hiv is transmitted into a new person the selective pressure is going to be different and so the virus that is going to be best fit will change um in that new person so i, I say i appreciate intelligent discourse because you know, I wrote a blog post a few weeks ago saying there's no evidence for increased transmission. And then you have people writing, you don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong. Well, I'm never going to answer you if you say I don't know what I'm talking about. 
you may have a point, but just say it. I do know what I'm talking about because <laughs> and all of us here have been working for many years in the field. And we're not always right, but I kind of know what I'm talking about. So don't say stuff like that. And you do it all the time. Raganiello doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know a strain from an isolate. I do. I really do. But if you have a point like Brian just did, I love to hear it. Um, and the point about China is right also. We can't be conflicted with China, although they conflict with us too, right? They don't particularly like us. I think uh, occasionally as this goes on, <clears throat> this is just a warning shot. The whole pandemic is just a shot across the bow that we ought to listen to in the face of climate change. That's the big one. It is a big one, yeah. Uh, Brienne, can you take the next one? Sure. Anne writes, I have been watching TWIV on YouTube since April. I found it after finding your virology course for the spring semester. I took the whole course in a couple of weekends while painting my kitchen cabinets. <laughs> I kept up with the first and some of the second lecture pretty well, although I would definitely not pass the course since I am just an attorney. I got a great sense of what the science is. It piqued my curiosity so much that I watched more courses on genetics and molecular biology. And of course, I started watching TWIV. This podcast is my rock during this pandemic. I am grateful to be able to hear the latest updates from top scientists rather than CNN. It's also great to hear the banter. The term wreck and yelling was genius. I'm grateful to you and your team and guests. Thanks for all you do. Regards, Anne. I know there's I no agree. question here, but I just wanted to put it in because I appreciate it. <laughs> yes, that's great, Anne. Thank you. Uh, okay. So I want to make a point here. He talks about top scientists. Speaking for myself personally, I don't think of myself as a top scientist. I've been thinking about this for a while. I'm one of thousands of people out there who can do exactly what we're doing. Okay? The, the, you are surrounded by people who have bathed in this for decades uh, and can uh, all contribute to this. I'm just a, a mouthpiece, if anything else. I don't think you're right. I don't think every scientist can do this. OK, because I tried to get a lot of people in there. No, <laughs> I can't just sit around and chat without a without a slide deck to look at it, without notes. I can't. Yeah, but they can do the They can do the analysis. OK, they, they can. They, they will can not do it science. in a forum like this. You guys wow. volunteered to do this and you're able to do it. So I think there are a lot of good scientists out there for sure, but there's not a not a lot of them could do absolutely this. And they don't. There's a reason why they don't. So I think it's unique. And people should appreciate. We're not the only science podcast, but there are not many uh, with scientists in it. So I th don't shortchange yourself, young man, <laughs> old man. Which I, I just, totally, I, I totally know the feeling. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I just like to. Yeah. What do you have an imposter? I, uh, an imposter <laughs> thing? What do you call that? Um, it is imposter syndrome. Yeah. Imposter syndrome. That's right. Hmm. By the way, speaking of rack and yelling, so. You know, my wife never listened to Twiv. For 12 years, she never listened to an episode, even her own episode on ivermectin. <laughs> but now her friends on Facebook are saying, this Twiv is great, Doris. And she said to me the other day, do you know they're calling you grumpy on, on uh, Twiv and, and rack and yelling? And I said, yeah, I know. And she said, boy, they should come here and watch you at home. <laughs> but I think it's funny that now it gets a little broader – and uh, she listens. Well, she probably doesn't listen, but she tell her friends. She said, my best friend is an absolute TWIV fanatic. How did that happen? I said, it's good stuff. We have good stuff. Yep. Uh, one of my friends who is really involved in marketing, um, in sports marketing, was talking to me the other day. And I was telling her something about TWIV. And she's like, wait. She's like, you guys are doing the things right. Do you, do you have merch? merch? And I was like, yeah, let me show you this, the, the site with the T-shirts and the things. And she was very impressed. <laughs> Good. Yeah, good. yeah, we do have merch. People have been uh, buying merch. I'm waiting to run into someone with a TWIV shirt. It's going to happen eventually. There you go. That's the World yeah. Tour shirt. Isn't that a cool shirt? Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a cool shirt. Sharon Isern designed it. It's really yeah, nice. Unfortunately, cool. there's not going to be a 2020 World Tour shirt. No. They had to make a joke with a 2020 World Tour blank. With a blank. <laughs> New York, a picture of the Zoom logo. Yeah. New York, New Jersey, <laughs> Michigan, Texas. Yeah. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Uh, Kathy, you're next. 
Jerry writes, greetings from Toronto, where it was 27C80F today. With several vaccines moving to stage three, I have a vaccine question. Some of the vaccines take a different approach to their methodology of delivering immunity. For the purpose of my question, let's assume the vaccines deliver just one or two years of immunity. So it's now 2022 or 2023, and I need to get my second vaccine. Do I have to stick with the same type of vaccine I received initially? Would it be beneficial to switch to a different kind of vaccine to give me extra immunity, or maybe just with an, just as an insurance policy? Is it harmful to mix vaccines? Could someone get two different types of vaccines in the same winter, again, as insurance? A related question assumes that the Moderna and Oxford vaccines are both available in 2021. How do I decide which vaccine to get, assuming I have a choice? Thanks and keep up the good work. And so as Vincent has pointed out, uh, this has been discussed before. Mixing vaccines is okay. You might not have a choice. Um, and then he says, <laughs> right at the moment, Moderna versus Oxford, uh, that being the one that we talked about uh, earlier in this show, uh, neither one impresses him at the moment. So, yeah, but that- you know, one example that uh, Rich and I have talked about are, you know, there was the, um, original vaccine for shingles and then a yeah. different one, better one came out and people got that. So uh, yeah, you're not locked into one. Yeah. Mixing is fine. The question about um, would you get, uh, would you, it was kind of, I can't find it now, but I thought the gist of it was, would you, would you get some different immunity if you got a different vaccine to different, to different things? And so Brianne's going to talk about that. So it sort of depends on what those vaccines are. Um, If the vaccines are using different sort of technologies in that one is mRNA and one is protein, for example, um, you might get some slightly different immune responses. Or if one was against spike and another was against a different protein in the virus, again, you might get some different immune responses. Um, If there are two that are nucleic acid um, with spike, then you're probably going to get relatively similar responses. Yeah, I think that goes back to John Udell's letter, right, where he talked about Mm -hmm. protein versus nucleic acid versus virus, what kinds of immunity you got. Yeah, I think the big, uh, as you pointed out, Brianne, I think the big issues are what exactly are the antigens in the vaccine? Is there just one or is there more? And two, whether it's delivered as a preformed protein or whether it's the protein made in the recipient. Mm. Okay. Or if it's Those an inactivated are, virus or replicating. Or. Yeah. Well, in a, see, yeah. I, I, I lump inactivated virus in with preformed protein. Makes sense. And I, and I think of uh, attenuated virus as proteins made on site in the recipient. Okay. I think if I had a choice, I'd pick the vaccine with more viral proteins in it. Yeah. Because I don't see why you would limit it to one. I just and I also like it. the idea of uh, uh, vaccines where the antigen is uh, synthesized on site. On site, okay. meaning in you. So, so that's sort <laughs> yes. of, you know, it's sort of a that's a it's it's a bias. There's there are some uh, uh, you know virus like particle vaccines that are uh, outrageously effective. Okay, that are delivered as yes, as protein, good. and they they may have they may actually because they're preformed virus like particles, they may actually yeah. c- have some advantages as vaccines relative to something that doesn't say make virus like particles on site. So for some viruses like influenza, if you just make the HA glycoprotein in cells, you get particles, empty virus like particles. Does that happen with SARS CoV two? Do we is there a vaccine candidate that's a VLP? Uh, I think there is, right? Uh, no, I don't know that there are any candidates that do that. VLP. Um, I have some inside information that I would have to get permission uh, to divulge on. But, oh, but there's uh, public there, lists there, you of can, uh, you can make virus-like particles with SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. Okay? but it takes more than just spike. Well, the, the Milken report. What was that? That's where the vaccines are listed. Uh, is it Milken? COVID. Let's try and find that. There we go. COVID nineteen. Treatment and vaccine tracker. 198 different vaccines. Wow. Let's search for um, virus like particle. VLP. VLP. Yeah. Here we go. Nah, this is not a VLP. <laughs> all right. I got 20 matches to VLP on this chart. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go through them all, but there are a bunch. Yeah. Here's one in Japan protein subunit VLP plus adjuvant. There are a bunch of them. 
I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a cool. virus-like particle uh, is a it gets is has a squishy definition at this Maybe. point. Maybe it could be. Uh, I'm guessing that there are people who put a bunch of spike into something in a cluster of some sort and call it a virus-like particle. Right. That's not necessarily the same as really looking like the virus. And my understanding is that you need more than just spike to make a virus-like particle. What are th there's an envelope protein and there's a matrix protein okay in the that are part of the mm. the actual uh, virus that uh could be important in making a virus like particle there could be other proteins important as well some of the best vaccines are infectious attenuated preparations polio measles mumps rubella yellow fever we only have one or we have a handful of those by the way rich this idea of things having to be confidential, which I don't just get from you, but from other sources as well. I think this stinks in this, in this climate, there should be no confidentiality. They're only, yeah. the government is pouring billions into you companies. What the hell do you have to be comp confidential for? It's nonsense. I'm sorry, Rich. Yeah, I don't mean to attack uh, you. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, nobody has told me that, uh, that uh, I have to be uh, confidential about this particular one. But if I'm going to talk about somebody no, else's I understand. work. Uh, for you, I at your say. level, it's fine. But it just triggered a thought because some people have said yeah. to me, I can't talk about this because it's secret. Save lives. No secrets. Come on. Uh, Rich, take the last email for today. That'll do it. Is that uh, Barry? Yeah, it's Barry, right? Yeah. Barry writes, hi, Twivers. I am... <laughs> I am twivering with excitement. <laughs> That's a show title. Twivering with excitement. Oh, man. That's good. Uh, somehow I have managed to convince the entire population of Melbourne to wear masks starting this Thursday, July, uh, 23rd July, as part of an impromptu citywide study into mask wearing and its effects on SARS-CoV-2 transmission. And he's got embedded here a little masked emoji. Nice. Um, <clears throat> recently, I have been busy setting an example by wearing a mask at work, and to my amazement, it looks like I have set the example and not changed the culture. <laughs> no one is wearing masks. Failure. Amazingly, the premier, that is state governor, of uh, Victoria, Daniel Andrews, must have heard my efforts and has added his authority to my cause by mandating mask wearing. Not just in my workplace, but for the whole of Melbourne, starting Melbourne. I got that right? Yeah. Starting no. Thursday, 23rd July. Can you believe it? One person can make a difference. Another emoji. Big smiling dude. Uh, what a great opportunity to see what mask wearing does for transmission. We Melbourneians, Melbourneians decided early in June to rest on our laurels and allow a near zero daily case count to balloon into several hundred over June, July. Finally, the premier put us back on lockdown stage three, two weeks ago. Restaurants, theaters, libraries are closed. It seems most other shops and businesses are still open. People congregate at the shopping malls, not me. This has resulted in uh, Melbourne's current seven day moving average to be a stable-ish 300 cases per day, whereas beforehand, it was worryingly increasing. Uh, threats of stage four restrictions have been made by Dan if we cannot get our case numbers down. Finally, following my example, mask wearing has been mandated by Dan to begin Thursday. Of course, at my workplace, people are not wearing masks yet. It seems they think it won't be a good idea or effective to wear a mask until Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Joking aside, I think adherence will be high, and over the next few weeks, we will clearly see how mask wearing in, impacts uh, the case count in the absence of any other confounding changes in the restrictions. I will report again in a few weeks with the results of the Melbourne mask study. Great. Uh, you know, I've wondered about this. Uh, it, there are a lot, uh, as I've thought about what's going on in Austin, there are a lot of variables that have been opposed at the same time. And it would be interesting to have a situation where none of the other variables change except that everybody starts wearing masks and see what a difference that makes. Cool. It was part of the Austin thing, right? The <clears throat> Texas thing, wearing masks, right? Uh, yeah, but there's a lot of things that happen. Around the 
uh, 4th of July weekend. So the, basically, the uh, things started opening up just before Memorial Day. And then following that, there was this huge increase. And then just before 4th of July, uh, the governor's office in particular got worried in, a, in addition to the local governance. And several things happened. They closed the bars. They backed the restaurants off to 50% from, I think, 75% occupancy. Mm. They said, uh, you can't have large crowds. I think statewide is less than a, cash be less than 100. Locally, it's less than 10. Uh, and a couple of days later, the governor uh, issued the uh, mask uh, mandate. Okay. So there were, uh, oh, and locally they closed the parks. So several things were imposed at once. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of variables. Yeah. All right. So in the past on TWIV, um, we had a feature called picks of the week and we eliminated it, I think in February, right? So we could give more time to talking about SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and it usually it could take a half hour sometimes as we all went through. <laughs> we could do them quickly though too. <laughs> our picks, science related picks. Although Condit often didn't have a science, he did other stuff. You know, no Eric Clapton's uh, version of "Don't Think Twice, It's All Right." That's science, right? Princess Bride. Princess Bride. Sure, well, you- that's really science because I use that in my teaching. Uh, <laughs> he's only he he's not all dead. He's only partly dead. I use, you know, I use. I mean, he's also a pro mask. So, true. I think we'd like to transition back into maybe a a, a quicker version of picks. You know, maybe this Friday we'll start again. But uh, Kathy's mentioned two. Uh, Maybe you could just briefly restate them. Sure. Sure. So one was the uh, fabric, the spoon flower fabrics, where you can get uh, custom designed fabrics. Takes them a while to print them. They can do small runs. Um, and they have some various uh, biology designs, and there's a special virus one that I didn't find till after I'd put in my order. Um, and uh, I can find the link, and Vincent can put that on the uh, web page. Also, I mentioned the listener pick from Bowdoin about uh, University of Michigan versus MSU short uh, pro mask video. And then the one that I wanted to really do about science was uh, an excellent episode of This Week in Virology, mm-hmm. the podcast, uh, Erling Norby Part 2. It was episode 639, done uh, in front of the wall of polio. And uh, Erling, again, talks about all kinds of interesting stuff about Nobel Prizes, scientists, virology. Uh, but uh, one thing that really caught my ear was his discussion about how there really are not biological races. Paraphrasing it, he says, I wish people would understand the simple fact that every human being has a forefather that moved out of Africa 60,000 years ago with dark skin and coming into new habitats, they tried to survive the challenges of those new habitats. The word race loses its meaning. Uh, and then he was talking about sequencing of the DNA um, and we are one race. That's all at about an hour into that podcast. He had a really cool haiku about RNA. I, I didn't refine that, but I'm going to listen again. Mm-hmm. And then he and Vincent were talking about Svanti Pabo, um, mostly with respect to sequencing uh, like the uh, ancient uh, hominids and so forth. But I knew of Pabo because uh, he did his PhD working on adenovirus E3 GP19K modulation of class one MHC. <laughs> um, and so every time I've heard of him, I've always thought of him as an adenovirologist mm. first. Cool. So. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. All right. And uh, next, maybe Friday, we can all have some picks too. We probably have a bunch stored. I should up. have been accumulating them. I'm going to have to scramble here. No, you'll be okay. You'll pick some movie or something. Yeah, Alan and I keep a queue of them, so I'll have some for a while. I have yeah. scattered. I have links scattered around. So all these yeah. things are at the website, which is microbe.tv. If you want to send us a question or comment, twiv at microbe.tv. If you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us financially. My goal is so that I don't have to record, edit, and post every episode myself and have more time for creation of things like what MedCram did with our episode, right? That's, that's my goal. We emphasize that nobody's getting paid for this. All right. No, nobody else is going to pay for this. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. That's in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. 
Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Brian Barker is over at Drew University. I don't know. It's about 13 miles from me, right, Brian? Yeah, more or less. So. Yep. That's in Madison, New Jersey. Thank you, Brianne. I'm, on Twitter, she is Bioprof Barker. She likes to hang out on Twitter, so watch out. Thank you, yeah. Brianne. <laughs> Thanks. It's great to be here. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. And like I said, it's a privilege to do this. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.